Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Keith Crumpy. I'm the Dean of Natural Sciences and Professor of Chemistry here at UNC Asheville. Uh, it is my pleasure to be the first person up in front of you this evening uh, to welcome you uh, to this event, to the S. Dexter Squibb Lecture Series uh, for 2010. Uh, before I turn it over to my former chemistry colleague, John Stevens, and I'm being the former, he's still in the chemistry department. Um, <laughs> I want to just let you know that it is really my honor to be here to welcome you uh, to this uh, event to celebrate Dexter. Um, I had the good fortune of being the last person that Dexter hired uh, in the chemistry department at UNC Asheville. Uh, I try not to think that I drove him off, uh, <laughs> but I had the wonderful uh, experience of working under him uh, for two years as the chair and if I had known uh, back then all the good things that I would have was going to learn from you that I could apply as the former chair of chemistry and now in my job as Dean I would have paid more attention. Um, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much Dexter for that. So it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you here this evening. Uh, I think you're in for a wonderful, wonderful experience uh, with tonight's lecture and I'd like now to turn this over to Dr. John Stevens. Thank you very much. Good evening. I've been asked to provide some comments about Dexter Squibb. I've known Dexter professionally for as long as anyone, I believe, 42 years. All those two, 42 years have not been pretty. <laughs> Let that one sink in. As both Dexter and I are both very intense, and we often did not agree when I told Dexter I was going to make some comments about him, he was a little fearful that I was going to roast him. <laughs> I do have plenty of material, but if I do this, there will not be any time for our speaker this evening. It's okay. I'm going to get a chance to roast him, I know. <laughs> but let me tell you one story about Dexter that does not get noted at these kind of events. Uh, because we talk about his teaching, we talk about uh, uh, <clears throat> his vision for the chemistry department. And uh, when I arrived here at UNCA, and it was at that time Asheville Biltmore College, I was most impressed with Dexter and his commitment and love he had for this institution. Um, for example, he would not miss a basketball game, either home or away. He became a legend here at UNCA, Asheville Biltmore College, in terms of being at those basketball games. Had nothing to do with chemistry, uh, had nothing to do with teaching, but he was there as part of, this, part of this community. This is another story of his personal and professional commitment. He's had an impact on the lives of our students. Dexter, appreciation for all you have done. Next time, I'm going to roast you. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. I'm Herman Holt, Chair of Chemistry. I have the honor of welcoming our uh, speaker tonight, Dr. George Atkinson. He's currently at the University of Arizona and does spent some time, lots of time in Washington, D.C. Um, it's a very different speaker this year in that um, Dr. Atkinson first met Dexter Squibb at Florida Presbyterian College, which is now Ecker College. At Florida Presbyterian College, Dr. Squibb started a chemistry department there, uh, and Dr. Atkinson got his degree from Florida Presbyterian College, and so you could say without Dexter, there wouldn't be no Dr. Atkinson. But I'm sure Dr. Atkinson would have done fine. Uh, he chose Florida Presbyterian um, over Harvard and Stanford and other institutions. He found the experience there to be great, small liberal arts institution. Some of you can relate to that. He then went on to Indiana University, got his PhD, and uh, got his faculty position. Um, obtained a fa faculty position at Syracuse University, then went to University of Arizona. He uh, started the Institute of Science Policy and uh, has worked with the government. Colin Powell and worked with Condoleezza Rice 
as uh, advisor to them, advisor to the secretary. So I'm going to keep it just that short. He's won many uh, degrees. He has an honorary degree from now Eckerd College and has won many teaching awards in 1992, I think it was, won the best teacher at University of Arizona or one of the best teachers at University of Arizona. So I know we are in um, great company here when we talk about teaching being a priority here at this institution. Dr. Atkinson, welcome. It's been a pleasure having you around the department the last, I guess is now 24 hours approximately, and look forward to the next uh, 24 Three. to so hours with you. So let's welcome our honor, um, our speaker this year, Dr. Atkinson. Thank you very much, Herman, for those kind remarks. I perhaps interpreted your comments in the next 24 hours, meaning that was what time I had. Is that correct? <laughs> sure. To say that uh, it's a pleasure to be here is truly an understatement. I uh, feel that I've been uh, honored by welcome, being welcomed into uh, the Dexter Squibb uh, fan club family. Uh, for a short time, and it is indeed a, an honor to do so. It's remarkable that all these years have gone by. I uh, did start in 1963. That's an ancient history for most of the younger people in this audience. Right? Uh, but the inspiration I received as a freshman student, I think inspiration you could perhaps translate into being terrified of not being able to do well in chemistry, uh, was softened immediately by the wonderful way in which uh, Dr. Squibb, Professor Squibb treated his students and I among them. So I'm extremely grateful for that and it uh, has made a big difference to me both professionally and, and personally. So to be invited to come back on this occasion is indeed a treat for me. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. But we should begin this conversation with the hero of the hour. <laughs> There's a picture taken from the archives of Florida Presbyterian College. Um, we um, did some searching for it, and uh, they were quite, quite pleased to find it. And uh, I know that, you know, one of the most remarkable things, he hasn't changed one bit. <laughs> <All right. laughs> this is a picture of him at work, and the person in this slide, the other person, is not me. Okay. Here he is working. Um, clearly, there's an instructional moment here. Um, I don't know who this is. Do you? Do you? Grover, Grover, Rand. Grover Rand. Okay, I, I wasn't sure who it was. So here we have an opportunity to see him in, in the laboratory at work. These are the moments when I think that uh, students don't particularly appreciate the type of attention because you're under pressure to perform. But years later, you know how important it was, having been a professor for many years, to take the time to be at the arm of a student like this. So what is it that I want to take some of your time with today? I, I'd like to turn their attention to what I think is a major problem uh, to be faced. It's an opportunity as well as a problem. But it has to do with the question of how the science in this country, and for that matter, the global community, is being used to address some of the great issues of our time. The great issues of our time, in many ways, can be identified uh, with how we approach problems. So some years ago, I asked myself the question, what, is there some characteristic of Americans who have defined how we approach problems? Is it something that was perhaps not exactly evident in other cultures? And having said that, is there a way the American community over the last, say, 50 years, because really 50 years has been the time we've led this parade in technology, is there something we could look at in terms of the model and how we decide to do this? But obviously, this is the 21st century. So now we have to face the realities of where we are. And so I'd like to speak briefly with some data on the, the, the way in which the 21st century has begun to evolve. I'd like to finally turn our attention to a project I launched a couple of years ago called the Institute on Science for Global Policy. It's an attempt to show you one way that this problem may be solved. And then if you're still here, I'd like you to join me in looking at how people over the last, uh, well, several centuries have articulated the conundrum of how you give scientific advice. Because really all these subjects have to do with how scientists explain themselves, 
how do they translate their successes in dark laboratories, <laughs> in, in places where the specific nature of their interests are so, so, are so well performed, so detailed uh, in terms of their own uh, challenges, how it's translated to the person in the street, the person who's actually paid for it in this country, the people who pay their taxes. I think there are a few still, right, who pay taxes? So let's begin with the first question. How is there, answer the question, is there an American way of making decisions? Well, we can return to the early days. And I return first to the question of the US Constitution. And the Constitution, in many ways, reflects this battle between reason and reflection versus force and violence. So here is an anonymous, a typical Washington term, anti-federalist paper in 1788. It basically says almost all governments that have been arisen among mankind have sprung from force and violence. The records of history inform us that none that have been a result of cool, dispassionate reason and reflection. It's a fairly disappointing conclusion. But fortunately, Hamilton was around, and he had a somewhat different point of view. It seems to have been reverse, reserved for, to the people of this country, the United States, not obviously quite the United States yet, to decide important question, the important question, whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they are forever destined to depend on their political constitutions on accident and force. We sometimes forget in the 1780s, this was a pretty revolutionary idea. This was something that mankind had not actually pursued. Well, let's speed forward to the 1940s. And we come to a man who really had tremendous influence on American foreign policy. Some of you will know his name, George Kennan. He was a diplomat at the State Department. He served in the Soviet Union at the time. And he wrote a, what was called the Long Memo, which described his view of what was about to happen at the end of the Second World War. He was not a very optimistic guy. But he basically defined how American policy was set up to deal with the Soviet Union. And it was based on these few principles. And I'm just quoting parts of it. There's lots of it left out here. Attempting to relate moral or ethical considerations to foreign policy involves the behavior of governments and not of individuals. Um, today, that would not be very popular. The function and commitments and moral obligations of governments are not the same as those of, indi of an individual. Governments primarily of obligation is to the interests of the national society it represents, not to the moral impulse or that elements of that society may experience. Getting depressed yet? The interests of the national society for which governments must be concerned itself are basically those of its military security, the integrity of its political life, and the well-being of its people. Now, if you take my word for it, George Kennan's long memo basically set the tone for the entire Cold War. And I think there's much evidence to say that was the case. Okay, so. Now let's jump to a slightly unrelated subject. What was it about the American system that relates to universities that implemented these, these very different ideas? What was, where was consideration, choice, calm reflection, and so forth? Well, let's look at universities. I would suggest to you that the successful characteristics of the U.S. system in general, not just here at the University of, of uh, <coughs> the uh, UNCA, were the following characteristics. First of all, there was a consistent commitment to secondary and higher education and scientific research. In other words, U.S. universities in general, not just U.S. research universities, would not be what they are today if it wasn't for 50 years of federal support. NSF grants were mentioned earlier today. Secondly, we fostered an open and welcoming environment for attracting students and researchers from around the world. Think of all the students you've come in contact with who were born in other countries, not only came here to be educated, but just as importantly to find their professional careers here, stayed here to do wonderful things. Private sector converted the scientific advances into world-class technologies that promoted social, societal well-being and created new global economies, the American model. And finally, policy based often, but not always correctly, on anticipatory views of emerging and at the horizon science and technology. To me, that's what characterized the last 50 or 60 years. These are characteristics that made the university system the envy of the world. How do we implement it? I'll take you through two steps, one in 1945. 
The U.S. government supports basic research in universities while industry pursues applied research. That's where I grew up. This is the famous Vanderveer Bush model, 1945. He wrote this paper. This led to the establishment of NIH and NSF and basically set the paradigm for the ascendancy of U.S. s &T. So what do you do? Well, the government supports that. Applied research is done in companies. Development was done in the commercial uh, arena, and you produce the product. But there were divisions. Very long, right? You didn't have to justify your research on making, what, five million a year. Maybe it's five billion a year. However, in 1990s, we have another person show up, uh, Gingrich, who had a different point of view. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, this model approach is no longer valid. The competition is now less military and largely economic. Science today is an international enterprise. We must assume leadership, a role in guiding the international science policy. So this is captured nicely in something called, uh, it was published some years ago, Pasteur's Quadrant of Innovation. And just look at this very briefly. It says, do I consider, when I'm about to do a research project, when I'm about to take money from somebody and do something, do I consider how it's going to be used? Well, basically the Vanderveer model said no, but I do have to consider whether it's basic research. So we're up in this quadrant. As the 1990s appear, we're way down here. You do research because it will be profitable, it has a particular goal, it's driven by the outcome in the process. Okay, so here's my conclusion from these models, very quickly. That in the, 19, in the, in the 21st century, many, I would sometimes, well, most, of the significant geopolitical policy and security issues facing the United States, and therefore globally, uh, in this uh, 21st century are connected with these remarkable, rapid, and profound science and technology achievements. Climate change, infectious diseases, energy, a long, long list. The urgency of addressing these short-term security issues, though, the ones that dominate the newspaper day in and day out, have got to be balanced with the patience and foresight to look at the long term. Where are the horizons? What are we putting in policies today? Why are we supporting universities and basic research, et cetera, et cetera? And finally, and this is perhaps one of the more controversial things to say on my part this evening, the resultant actionable decisions, things that policymakers will actually do, not just get you out of your office by talking about it, must be incorporated into U.S. strategic security policy. HIV AIDS was never supported in terms of research by the United States in large amounts until Secretary Powell declared it a national security issue. Okay, well, how are we going to do it? Let's take a look at some famous, just a couple famous people. Arthur Clark, people surely know Arthur Clark. Uh, Clark is uh, viewed as uh, one of the gurus of predicting technology, but he is quoted as saying, those who believe I'm a predictor or a prophet are incorrect, I'm rather just an extrapolator. I take what I know and I go to the next step. And he has this wonderful three rules. I think the professors in the audience should not read this. When a distinguished but elderly, I don't know what that word means, scientist states that something is possible, he or she is almost certainly correct, right? When he or she states that something is, is impossible, can't be done, he is always likely wrong. And I'll give you some examples at the end of this famous ones. The only way of discovering the limits of possibilities is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. The, you know, if, if it isn't almost magic, which is what he says finally, you're not really doing advanced research. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And in all of your fields in science, you know this to be true. Whether it's not only your optics, you know, it just looks like magic. Suddenly we understand what it's about. So let's also remember, before I get to a few examples of what we're facing, Let's remember the issue of uncertainty. And this comes from Richard Feynman, who was a remarkable individual. Um, a scientist is never certain. All of our statements are approximate with the different degrees of with certainty. When a science statement is made, the question is not whether it is true or false, but rather how likely it is to be true or false. Most people outside science don't understand that at all. They want an answer of yes, or no. They're not interested in your data. They don't want maybe. They want to know what is going to happen. 
Now it's pretty straightforward if you're at the top, as I said earlier today, of a 10-story building. You're about to exit the window. Uh, I can pretty well tell you with certainty what will happen next. But if I launch a spacecraft to a distant planet, there's a degree of uncertainty. I may miss the planet. The thing may stop working halfway there. Uh, lots of things can happen. But I still need multiple billions of dollars to do the experiment. And there are an infinite number of examples of it. But the degree of uncertainty is not something that most people outside the scientists have a good grasp of. And by the way, scientists don't usually tell them. Right? Most research grants don't begin with saying, I'm not really sure what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm not really sure it's going to work. I'm not really sure that you should give me the money. <laughs> and so the one other point I would make here is the following. It's, it's something I prefer to say myself. Performing successful scientific research always depends, often depends, on boundary conditions. You know what parameters you're going to choose not to vary, not to change. In science policy, this is not an option, since no issues can be ignored. Human, meaning governmental behavior, ensures that there are no safe assumptions about the boundary conditions for policy. We spent billions of dollars on the Central Intelligence Agency to watch the Soviet Union. Did they predict the collapse of the Soviet Union? No. They were, they were is among the most surprised people in the world when it happened. There's always uncertainty in policy. And the person who tells you there isn't is not earning their salary. So you have to live with uncertainty, but you still must make the decision. OK, so are there lessons learned? Yes. I think one of the lessons is, no matter what degree of science you're talking about, if you want to get it accurately, you must not ignore the political landscape. Policy is politics. It is not science. And uh, are there political scientists in the audience? Politics is not political science. And with the history teaches us very quickly. Gov global leadership in science and technology is extremely transitory. Many of my students who come to my laboratory think we've been leading technology in the United States for at least three centuries, maybe two millennia. Absolutely not true. Here we have a case in the 19th century, in the outset of the 20th century, Europe was the dominant factor. We've only been leading this parade from the 1945-50 period on, and today, it's dominated by international collaboration. It is not something about to happen. I'll show you some data to confirm it. In addition to all these three things, the problems are extremely complex and difficult. These are not the problems we became uh, accustomed to in laboratories as students. And maybe the most distressing point in our conversation at dinner about global technologies is that you may have scientific understanding developed globally, but the technology manufacturing jobs, things of that nature, are developed within a global framework. If you can build something in another country outside the United States cheaper, you will do it. And we've proven that infinite times. So let's consider, clearly my capabilities of PowerPoint are somewhat waning here. Let's consider three pieces of information to prove this point quickly. Number one. I'd like to show you just a little bit of data to confirm the fact that global innovation systems are completely dominant today. Number two, one of the biggest unstated problems we have is recognizing the impact of global population. And number three, these S&T advances have tremendous impact on societal and, mora, and social mores. It's no longer something that a chemist does in a laboratory and nobody knows about it. It has tremendous impact well outside the, the scientific community. Okay. Well, let's begin with the question of innovation. This is a plot. Chemists have to have data, sorry. This is a plot of country and the gross national product in billions of dollars, 2004 US dollars. Now, I replotted this over here so you can get a sense of the scale. This is the United States. This is all of Europe. This is Japan. This then is breaking Europe down. I think that's Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain. This is the rest of the world. Any doubt who's winning? Resources are clearly in the hands of the United States. Number two, if you're a physicist, are there physicists in the audience? Own up, OK. OK. If you want to get tenure, I presume here, as in most places in the United States, you publish in one of these two journals. So it was a standard against which you measure the success of physics research. 
In 2080, the United States and Purple produced about 70% of all publications. 20, 25 years later, we're producing about the same amount, but it's now one-third of the total. Two-thirds of the pro those, pu those publications are coming from other countries. So there's not a question of about to lose leadership. You, we've, we've allowed the world, uh, appropriately, to take leadership. Is it important in terms of where these are published? Well, is the United States is known to be collaborative. Remember I said we invited the world in to help us. Well, today, here this blue line shows you the number of papers published in the United States, a fraction of all of them, are coming from just pure American researchers, only American authors. This, I beg your pardon, this is the US collaborating with international people. I, I'm sorry, these are the US collaborators international. The red is the pure American authors, only American residents. And this is the international community. And if you apply an average and say, what are the really important papers, the one with all the citations, may or may not be true, you'll see it's even worse. This thing is the American community going down, this is the world. So today, 60%, approximately, of the world's population, considered the best in the world, are coming from outside the US. How about the population issue? Year 2000. All right, so we're up in here somewhere. This gray area is the percentage of the world population in undeveloped or underdeveloped countries. This is the United States and parts of Europe. The way in which we led ourselves to the beginning of this parade, the way in which we succeeded, is back over here. This is a very different community. All right. How about the age, this is a depressing slide, I apologize. Dexter, this is not something I, I, I'm very proud of, but I, I felt obligated to show this. This is the age distribution in developed countries. Europe, North America, Australia, and Japan. Okay, so there's this kind of curve here. This is female and male. You don't have to look at the details except when you look at developing countries. See what the, the youth are. Totally different distribution. And does it matter? Does it matter how much money you earn? Does it mean a more pleasant life? Well, it certainly means a longer life. This is the life expectancy based on the per capita income. The United States is here in the 80s. Japan, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Korea. As this curve comes down, there's China. It drops precipitously. So clearly it's the obvious that these do make big differences. Do they make differences in culture? I would submit to you that the, the tenets, the mores of science, are the, exactly the mores that many people pr profess that want to spread the, through the world, and that is the ideas of a knowledge-based society. Science promotes all of these things, and you'd re I think you'd list most of them if you were trying to promote a democratic and open society. Access to information, powers the citizen. Transparency through open publications. Promotes meritocracy, the ideas through peer review. Supports creativity promotes mutual respect for diverse ideas. These are the principles of science, and they certainly are the ones that influence societies. And do they influence, even in times, very difficult times, of social and, and, and uh, arrest? These data were taken in 2004 by the uh, Pew Foundation at a height of concern over uh, terrorism. This column shows you whether people in these parts of the world admired US science and technology. These, this column shows you whether they admired ideas and customs spread for the United States. These numbers are not passing. These numbers still deserve some, some optimism. So even at a time when many people felt very uncomfortable with politics and the United States positions, science and technology was admired. It was admired. Did it mean something for universities? Yes. Here are graduate students entering school. I mentioned to you we had a welcoming environment, which is the primary goal of some of our success. Here were the drops in 03, 04, 45%, 28%, 24%. These are students not coming. It came back until finally you had some positive numbers a couple of years later, but remember they were very low to start with. So people voted with their feet. They didn't, they didn't embrace the American model that built us into this situation. Depression will get better in a moment. Armed conflict and terrorism, where do you find these? This happens to be from your, your locally funded intelligence community. 
These are areas in red where the highest, highest probability of, of uh, armed conflict in, in terrorism. These are the poorest, obvious companies. And how about disease? Zoonotic diseases, the transmitting of diseases from a, an animal to a human being, which is the primary source of inf influenza and all kinds of diseases, same type of pattern. If you were to compare this with the one a moment ago, you'd see very similar patterns. Except it's interesting, notice up here, Europe is also heavily, uh, heavily involved with this. Every one of these pieces of data, I think, support the fact that the model we use to get where we are is not the model that currently exists. Right? It's just not the way it's going to be. And here's the one that maybe should worry all of you, or perhaps not. This is a piece of data that was taken by, the, by NOAA of the Arctic ice sheet. This white area is the Arctic ice sheet in 2007, in September of 2007. Now you remember, the Arctic ice is, is actually pure water. So when it enters the Gulf Stream, which is salt water, it changes the density, a little bit of chemistry here, and what happens is the Gulf Stream, the warm water drops. So if you're about to buy property in northern Britain, I'd be a little careful, because the weather's going to get a lot colder. And that's only one of the many issues here. The purple line is the normal place that we have seen the edge of this ice, ice sheet over a period of at least 100 years. In one year, it went from this size to that size. I can't tell you it was due to something we did. I can tell you we should hope it was due to something we did. Because if it wasn't due to us, it probably is beyond some control. So whatever we're doing from a social point of view, whatever we're doing in our policy, whatever we're making decisions about in universities, the laws of chemistry and physics and biology are moving on. And that's probably the biggest message to, to be called. Now, we tried to do something about this, and I just want to spend a few minutes before I finish with some degree of optimism for you. A couple of years ago, um, I became interested enough when I left government to try to do something about it. I felt that publishing another 200 papers that no one read would not be particularly useful anymore. <laughs> um, so we launched this Institute on Science for Global Policy. It is an attempt to fill this gap between scientific understanding and the policy community. There are hundreds of reports written by the science community, hundreds. Very few are ever read and very few of those are ever read by this community. So we are in the business of trying to fill this gap. And we do it with a piece of common sense. What we try to do is assemble an argument, a debate. What we try to do is take scientifically credible options as defined by just a few scientists, people we interview. We interviewed about 130 recently on infectious diseases. So the topic for two years plus is infectious diseases. We assemble just a few scientists and we ask them, what do you think the situation is? What, can you, what, what should you do? What would you tell a, a science advisor, a, a politician, a policymaker? What would you tell them to do tomorrow? Secondly, we bridge this gap with a model that is actually so common sense you'll be somewhat amused that we actually think it's worth talking about. And that is we use a critical debate, something scientists do all the time. The countries involved, seven of them bring a policy community of policy people, assistant secretaries of state, like myself, uh, analysts, so forth. They choose, they bring who they want. We assemble the scientists to do something that most of the faculty members here will be stunned by. We ask them to reduce their thinking to three pages. No more, not a, not a, not a line more, three pages, what are the realities, what you should do about infectious diseases? Or another series of meetings, cybersecurity, or in other meetings, energy, and so forth. And so, those debates take place in a not-for-attribution environment where there is absolutely, you cannot quote anybody, there is no opportunity to do anything other than argue. We publish a summary of it, but we, you cannot, cannot quote anybody. So a, so a policymaker can actually say to you as a scientist, I don't understand why you think climate change is important. I don't think, I understand why you think animal diseases will transmit to humans. Why is this so important? Each scientist gets 90 minutes to debate their paper. 90 minutes. More than I'll take this evening, I promise. But they only get five minutes to speak. The audience of policymakers gets to debate them and question them for the remainder of the 90 minutes. 
So there's absolutely no reason that you shouldn't be terrified of this if you're a scientist. You're about to put your opinion on paper, and you're about to be questioned about it by 65 of the most powerful, hopefully powerful, uh, policy people in these countries. We're a guide. The, the guide is to, to help these governments decide how they're going to invest their financial and human resources. Human resources, you can read university resources. We must look anticipatory at these strategic roadmaps because we're looking at the next generation of science. It's moving so quickly that if you don't prepare for that, you're not going to have any opportunity to either protect yourself from the consequences or utilize it. And the debates here are focused on this question of what the policy person will do. Not what the scientist wants them to do, it's what the policy person will do. The scientist really gets no vote. They get an opinion, they get to argue, but they actually make no decision. And in the case here of this community and universities, we also include students, graduate students and undergraduates who participate in this process because I'm absolutely concerned that you can't wait till you're as old as I was to see how bad this problem is. I want to see people who are in their 20s get a first-hand look at this laboratory experience to show how difficult it is to convince a person who is not trained as a chemist what the problem is. So that's the issue. So we do it, as I mentioned, with the conferences. There are seven conferences that I'll show you in just a moment on infectious diseases. These are the countries involved at the moment. There is a network of international universities who recommend graduate students who spend six months with us. And there are groups of undergraduate schools as well, foundations and companies. The decision-making process is to be enhanced by this group of, in this case, seven, six conferences over two years. Next one will be in Washington area in October. The next one is in Lake Como in Italy. Nobody, everybody know where Lake Como is? Yeah, uh, if you'd like to sign up, let me know. Well, everybody wants to come. Um, these are all invitation-only meetings, by the way. The next one's in Japan. The next one's on the West Coast of the United States, then back to Europe and so forth. And now let me, I've said this, I don't want to bore you with this uh, too much, but let me now summarize what my point was and then lead you to a little more optimism. I contend with you that the real issue today is the missing, the missing group of people. We have remarkable scientists, engineers in this community. Remarkable. It has been a wonderful time uh, to be a scientist in an academic institution. The last 50 years has been a golden time. We have politicians, many of whom, you may not believe me, are really concerned about doing something productive. They really need the advice in a way that they can use it. They really need it. And there are those, of course, who could care less, I must tell you. That doesn't come as a surprise to you, I'm sure. But what we're missing is the middle group. The people who have a leg in the credibility community of science who can stand and say, I've thought this through, I represent a credible option for you, and I can explain it to you. I don't have to, forgive me, spend all your time trying to prove to you I'm smart. I, they, you know I'm smart, right? Why am I up here? But I've trained myself to try to convey to you the essence of the problem which is important to you, the policy person. That group is missing. I don't know where those people are. Okay? And I, I'm concerned that without them, we're not going to be able to make a direction. It will probably require convincing the private sector probably the foundations of this community, which are marvelous. The individuals who care about this issue because government is almost incapable bureaucratically of supporting this. It's just a tough sell. We've been successful at getting governments around the world to support the Institute. That's, that's a good news. But I think in the long run, the scale of the problem requires people with more vision. So uh, these are the goals. I've, I think I've mentioned them to you uh, earlier. So let me now turn to the end of my remarks. I found in Washington, being a pretty naive guy, that it was very important for me to quote famous dead people. If you can find a dead person who is famous enough to be recognized, who said what you want to say, it's okay, right? You can get away with it. And um, the average lifetime of Assistant Secretary of State is 18 months. Uh, I got seven years out of it. So I, I, I recommend this to the students as well. Quote a dead person occasionally. So let's take a few, look at a few dead people. Churchill, is, I mean, actually I know that Churchill said this because uh, Claire, Claire Hall at Cambridge has his papers. 
And when I was there a few years ago, I asked him, did he actually say this? Because a lot of people attribute things to people that didn't say it. But he said, what man desires is not knowledge. This comes as a shocking moment to scientists. He, they want certainty. That's, that's actually probably true. However, Shaw, who didn't really respect many people, said if all econo economists, and I add scientists, were laid end to end, they would not reach a conclusion. <laughs> Somewhere between Churchill and Shaw, I got a problem, right? And it's true. I, I mean, in our heart of hearts, as scientists, I think we know it's true. Right? Now, we would argue a lot, and eventually we would come to consensus, but I don't think we'd actually agree. And then you have this very profound statement. I really like this very much. It's a play written in 1939 by Bertolt Brecht. This is a more serious way of saying it. The aim of science is not the, to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit on infinite error. That's what he has Galileo say in this play. Right? Anybody ever seen this play performed? Yes? Th this, this is a gem for me. This, this is something that we should remember. Scientists are not there to tell the Secretary of State. Well, you can tell him if he steps out the 10-story window, he'll, he'll regret it, at least for a few seconds until it's all over. <laughs> But there are many things, of course, that we deal with which we cannot put in absolute terms. But the story goes on. The conundrum of science for science in the 21st century is, let's look at John Kennedy. There are costs and risks to every course of action, but they are less than the long-term costs and risks of comfortable inaction. And yet, I would submit to you in the politic body of the American community for probably 30 years or more, maybe it goes back 50 years, we have been much more comfortable with inaction. And under the circumstances, the laws of chemistry and physics just haven't paid attention, right? And so things have marched on. But Mencken, again with a bit of humor, but I love Mencken, <laughs> there is no idea so stupid that you can't find a professor who will believe it. <laughs> right? In our heart of hearts, we know that he was probably being a bit facetious, but a level of truth. And, and Russell, the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. And there's truth in that, right? People who are experts know there's always a level of uncertainty. But those who will accept the opening sentence are pretty sure that it's got to be correct. And we are laboring under that problem today. But it goes on. You can't count on scientists or the media always being correct now. I'm not proposing that we've got it right, all right? We, we have our problems. And there are lots of examples. In 1903, Millic <coughs> Michelson, Michelson, the interferometer guy, the most important fundamental laws and facts of physical sciences have all been discovered. <laughs> People remember when Einstein published his first papers? The great 1905, right? So for two years, this guy was right. <laughs> Physics as we know it will be over in six months. <laughs> My physics colleague, I presume, will agree this has not happened, right? Yeah. But this, don't re remember, is, is a better two decades after, after Einstein's papers. Okay. Hopefully you're still laughing. Uh, Lord Rayleigh, 1896. I do not have the smallest molecule of faith in aerial navigation <laughs> other than ballooning. Lord Rayleigh is a pretty important guy. There's no Dexter Squibs up here, so you're okay. <laughs> Percival, all this stuff about traveling around the universe in spacesuits belongs back where it came from on the cereal box. <laughs> 1952, President Eisenhower committed ourselves to, actually earlier on than John Kennedy, to a space program for intelligence reasons, for security reasons, right? Not very well known. If there's a formula for penicillin, I'll give up chemistry and grow mushrooms. Uh, I, people, I'm sure in science, know Corn Forest's name. You certainly know Do Dorothy Hodgkin's name. Okay, well, if I displayed my ignorance of organic chemistry, it would be a terrible moment in my life. But I have a lot of ignorance of it. And finally, Shaw again. The newspaper, meaning the media, are unable seemingly to discriminate between a bicycle accident and the collapse of civilization. <laughs> Some resonance with you? Okay. 
So let me finish with a couple of other media, just a couple, to remind you of what the theme was this evening and, and keep you from being delayed much on it more. These two guys are Karen Combley. You notice the legs are crossed here? All I'm saying is now is the time to develop technology to deflect an asteroid, right? Obviously advice beyond their, their days. Okay, like you know something Intermed doesn't know? I find this a particularly poignant moment. The internet seems to have completely wiped out any knowledge I have, because people who tell me instantly they know something and they have no idea where it came from. And finally, this one's another one. Oh, on the internet, nobody really knows you're a dog. <laughs> so we, we now face the 21st century with, um, with a sobering set of choices. The humor, hopefully, has relieved some of your attention. Okay. But I got to tell you, I think these are serious matters that require the attention of universities, uh, public, uh, public, publicly interested citizens, the government for sure. Today, governments are the primary res uh, unit responsible for figuring out how to incorporate science and technology. We, don't, we may not like that, but they have the resources, they have the decision-making process. If NSF tomorrow comes out and say, no longer can you fly an airplane, we're going to go ballooning, there'll be grants, proposals submitted the next day. So that's a serious matter. So we have no choice, I think, but moving through the governmental process. That's important to us. We've got to figure out how to do it better. And so I leave you with one more slide to remind you what, in my opinion, is the essence of this. And I return to Berto Brecht. You know, we're not in the business of saying there's no risk. <laughs> At least I'm not. There's always risk, absolutely always. There's always uncertainty. It's what level of risk can you tolerate to make a decision. And as we hesitate, we certainly allow the situation to come back. And then my favorite of all quotes is this one. Most of us are more responsible for what we decide not to do than for what we do. This is Voltaire, okay? And so putting it in a modern context, the question is, in, in my mind, no longer a question of is there a problem, the question is, what degree are we being able to deal with the issues of the errors of commission? The decision not made or postponed is a decision, period. Can't get away from it. And Voltaire understood it a long time ago. We need to remind ourselves of it. But to try to make sure you don't think too badly of me, let me quote Marty Rees, who uh, was the astronomer Royale when he said this. He's now the head of the Royal Society. And he said, quoting Woody Allen, eternity, and perhaps this presentation, is very, very long, especially toward the end of eternity. <laughs> I, can't, um, I can't say enough to, uh, about admiring what Dexter Squibb has accomplished in his career. I'm reminded of a little uh, experience when I went to Arizona about pioneers. Anybody who starts one program, one place, Dexter, is certainly a pioneer. To do it three times successfully is a very remarkable person. But I remember what they told me about the second part of being a pioneer. Remembering this comes from Arizona. They said, all these changes you want to make as department head, that's, you're going to be a pioneer. You know what happens to pioneers in Arizona? They wind up with arrows in their back, face down on the ground. <laughs> I think you're to be congratulated, not with the, you have no arrows that I can tell. You're not certainly in any prone position. Rather, what you have is a community of scholars who have enormous respect for your achievement, your colleagues, your students, uh, the friends of this community. Uh, I think by their expression of, 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 of faith in what you did and, and appreciation for your achievement, you were a successful pioneer. So I have a new definition, a successful pioneer. I'd say that's Dexter Squibb. Thank you. get started with questions, I'd like to present to Dr. Atkinson a plaque, the S. Dexter Squibb Lecture Series in Chemistry 2010, George Atkinson, University of Arizona, Science and Global Policy. Thank you very much for coming, and for you, we have this. Your name will go on uh, another plaque of ours that will remain permanently in Zeiss Hall. Thank you, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you.
I'd like to thank everyone. Brenda Henderson, stand up. Uh -uh. Stretch your legs. Thank you, Brenda. She helps to dot our I's and cross our T's. John, Keith, uh, thank you very much for speaking this morning, uh, this afternoon, this evening. Where are we today? Um, <laughs> uh, and thank you all for coming. We're going to take some questions. On the right side, we have Dr. Wasileski, who has a microphone. Uh, as the sign says, if you're going to ask a question, please use a microphone. So we're going to open the floor up for questions. As we go up to Dr. Hurd here for a question, tomorrow at 2.45 in Zeiss Hall 1-4, he will, uh, Dr. Atkinson will talk about nonlinear science. Uh, since, since you're tracking down uh, possible misnomers in chemistry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to track this one down as well as a, uh, as, well as a few other people. Apparently, um, Ostlin said at uh, the World's Fair in St. Louis, atoms died with Dalton. <laughs> and a few people are trying to track down if he actually said that or not. But okay, so, so you, you picked up on some really, really interesting things and, and one that I think is going to be really important going forward is condensing our thoughts. And, and science is still sort of stuck in the, the lengthy prose phase, but I think things are very slowly turning around. The American Chemical Society has the science ambassadors idea, uh, Sigma Xi has the mini conference idea. Do you think that's, that's the way things are going, that we're going to have to shrink our thoughts and certainly get rid of the verbosity of science? Well, um, I, can, I can, by the time this is over, you'll throw me out, believe me. The, the problem, I think, is, is in many ways more severe. And I'm not a Cassandra. I'm not trying to tell you the sky has already fallen. But I think it would be not very prudent of us to realize the seriousness of the issue. Those are wonderful programs. I, I, I congratulate them on doing it. But in the meantime, I showed you the ice sheet problem. That happened in one year. So it seems to me we are facing uh, a number of pieces of information that tell us we need to move uh, more judiciously, more quickly, prudently, but more quickly. And so I would suspect that the policymakers in Washington and London and Tokyo and Beijing do not know about any of those activities. We have to certainly engage the public, no doubt about it. Right? But I think it's too late to wait for the public <laughs> to rise up and, and you know, to drive this process. I think the scientific community has a responsibility of going more directly to those who do control this decision-making process. Now, it's a tough row. It is not easy. It's never going to be easy. But you have to generate a certain level of credibility with people and then become involved in helping a longer-term process evolve as these problems come up. Now, had we had this policy, I showed you Gingrich's point of view and I showed you Bush's point of view. Both were basically incorrect uh, when you think about it. It was wonderful the NSF got created and so forth. But it was a linear model and it didn't last for as long as we'd like it to. So I think we have to restructure how we do this and it's not, in my opinion, going to go through the organizations of the Air American Chemical Society, which I'm working on a project for, or AAAS, or even the Academy. Beautiful reports. There are hundreds and hundreds of gorgeous reports, beautifully written. I help pay for some. They're late, they're long, and nobody reads them. Okay? So don't tell the Academy. <laughs> so I, I think it's I think yes, condensing our thoughts is correct. But can we can we count, for example, on the fact that climate change will slow down? No, no problem, we'll put that one aside. Uh, are we worried about infectious diseases? Well, we should be. Are we worried about <laughs> it goes down a very long list. So it's time to get moving, and it's time to get over the, the Washington disease of describing the problem. It is a disease. How many things do you go to, and everybody tells you there's a problem? How many meetings do you go to, and they say, I think you should do this? Very few. George, asking uh, an ex is it on? Okay, uh, an ex colleague. Um, 
this is at an international level of discussion you're having with these different countries. And it takes people of experience to get to that, not only in the science, but also the politics. Yes. Uh, there's a role for students you described. And uh, people on the political side don't have the science, but the interaction with the students in the local communities. The issue is the same at community levels too. Yes. So would you comment on the role of getting people involved in this kind of a process at two different levels before you get to the international one? Well, I agree, Ray. Ray. Ray taught me everything I really actually know about physical chemistry, and he did it in one year while I were <laughs> we were still in school together. Ray is exactly right. This is a multi-dimensional problem, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that our institute will handle the entire problem. But I think there are, there are ways of spinning off the basic principle. First of all, I'm encouraged after two, two plus years, three years plus, that people have embraced the idea there should be a debate. Right? And, the, and the, the elements I described to you are correct. Right? Very short papers, real debate. Don't worry about the newspapers, they're not, they're not there. However, there's no less an urgency of getting the local communities engaged in the same debate. And I, what I'd like to see happen, in my best of interpretations, is that the model is accepted at the local level, transformed as needed, but the idea remains more or less consistent. The canonical idea is debate it. Do it without the press there. I mean, those in the fourth estate can criticize me, but for a while you need some degree of comfort saying things you don't want to see in the paper. Now, sunshine rules and all that, um, I'm in trouble. But there are ways of modifying it in a way that can be appropriate, and I, I leave it to better minds than mine. But you've got to get started. It's time to stop saying we've got a problem, and it's time to say this is not only a matter of the educational interest of the academic community, and I'll be harsh on the academic community, most of academics have turned into lobbyists. Why do we show up in Washington? We lobby for the NSF budget. We lobby for the NIH budget. We lobby for the Department of Energy. We lobby for our favorite energy projects, solar energy versus nuclear energy and so forth. The power people don't understand, and I, I guarantee you, they don't understand the efficiency of a photovoltaic cell. What they understand is you're asking them to make a decision to put resources here versus someplace else. That will be driven by public opinion, I agree. So yes, absolutely. There's every reason to get moving. And so I, I have only total respect for every community that begins the process. I'm saying it's time it's past time to get moving. It, it is just not going to be feasible to attack these problems. The last thing I'd say, Ray, is I'm worried, uh, very concerned over the scale of these problems. So again, to be, to be controversial, water is a huge issue in the African continent. It'll, it'll probably be a problem here for too long, too. But the African continent is a crisis. We have many well-intentioned, skilled people who go to Africa as a team. Uh, engineers, engineers Without Borders is a very good group of people. They go and they dig a well. They dig five wells. A year or two later, they go back and the wells don't work because the people don't have the wherewithal, the training to maintain them. Oh, and by the way, the village that didn't get the well doesn't like it because now they're economically disadvantaged. Right? And it, it seems unfair, but this wonderfully generous act is not scaled to the problem. It just, it makes us feel better, we go home, but the problem perpetuates itself. So um, I think that the local efforts are, are critical, but they're not really the main subject anymore. The main subject is how do you mobilize major units of society called governments to move forward? They have the resources, I assume, and they have the willpower to do something, but without that type of scale, I'm afraid we don't get to the right issue. Now, that's a concern, maybe I'm wrong, but that would be my answer to your question. You're very generous to be here so, so late. I, I wanna thank you. Uh, for your talk, I want to say, uh, and, and for taking time to talk with me uh, the, the, this afternoon, uh, or this morning, I'm losing track of time when, like Herman said, um, I love the talk and agree with everything that, that you said tonight. When, as, a, as a product of an institution very similar 
to UNC Asheville, very similar to Eckerd College. As a chemistry professor at that type of institution, I believe that institutions like UNC Asheville, like Eckerd College, have a key role to play in solving this scientific communication problem. Uh, you used as an example, uh, both in your slides and in, in some of your answers, the, the idea of global warming. Uh, and, you know, not only, I mean, when I watch the political commentary and listen to the political commentary, right. the debate now of the general public and the media has moved beyond, well, is it anthropogenic or not, to is it happening or not, all right? And I put a lot of that, personally, I put a lot of that blame on the scientific community, as we talked early, or earlier today about, right. and our failure to look beyond our experiments, beyond our laboratories, beyond the details and the, and the papers. So my question is, as somebody who has spent a significant amount of your professional career in Washington, D.C., dealing with politicians, how do people like me as the dean of natural sciences, the associate provost who's over here, Herman who's the chair, how do we convince politicians that liberal arts colleges, whether they're public or whether they're private, have a significant role to play in helping solve the communication problem that you have so clearly articulated? Well, if, um, if I had a really good answer to that, <laughs> Kevin, I'd probably be in better shape, but I'm going to give you pieces of it, but I apologize for not having a comprehensive uh, answer to you, for you. First of all, people do pay attention to their, their communities. Whether you're, let me use the worst of all examples, political uh, elections. They certainly do pay attention to what this community thinks when the guy is running for office, the person's running for office. So there, there is a role that can be played. And I'm not suggesting at any level there be, should be total consensus. I'm not arguing about any, I never mentioned whether I felt it was true, false, or whatever. I just showed you some data, okay? So whatever your conclusions are, there should be a conversation which focuses on the degree of consensus and the degree of uncertainty. Those are the two things. Now I once uh, was attending a dinner in Washington uh, a few months ago, very articulate individual, very famous, talked about how, how literally 97, 98 percent he was sure that climate change was occurring and it was anthropogenic. At the end of the conversation we were having dinner, a very distinguished lady who was running a major corporation sat next to me and she said, gee it's really good to know that it hasn't been settled yet. <laughs> that is a point where you have to engage. You have to go back and say, no, wait a minute, I'm, uh, 97 percent is pretty good. If I can get that in the, in uh, the next lottery, I'll be okay. So there is, there is a role to play, I think it's an engagement, and I think universities can do this in a number of ways, and I would suggest this as we talked about this morning, symposia run by the university. It's a, it still remains one of the most respected parts of society, the most egalitarian, respected community of scholars. It's called a university. Have the debate, you know, assemble the people, bring them here, invite them to come. If you get five, great. Maybe next time you get 10, maybe you get 50, maybe you get 500. But you've got to have the conversation. And I think universities have an obligation to give back to the community in that sense. And specifically, to be highly critical of my profession, and sorry, Dexter, this is something you led me into, we have done a poor job of this, a very poor job. We seem to be willing to uh, convince ourselves and our colleagues in the field of something, argue it out, but we're very nervous about stepping out and arguing in public. Well, time's up. In my opinion, this is a role, as I said before, that missing, that missing group of people in the middle. I'm not saying I'm right, wrong. I haven't told you how I actually feel. I just, you gotta have the conversation. And universities have an obligation. Most universities in this, this, this country established, the Langrand University established in 1863 by a guy named Abraham Lincoln. Right, Land-grant universities had three criteria, research, teaching, and public service. In those days, it was largely for farming communities, agricultural exchange, okay, very important, critical. Today, I'd say you could redefine it. It's to have a venue, a forum, an arena in which you have the debate. May not win, you may not like the debate, you, may not, you might not like the people who come, you gotta have the debate. So universities have a way and a responsibility to give back to the community which gave you whatever public funds they gave you. I know it's shrinking, but whatever they gave you, you have an obligation to go back into the arena 
and provide venues for that conversation. And I guarantee you there are moments when I've been in public when you don't like to hear what's being said. I mean, you, I mean, you makes you cringe, but that's okay. Remember, the Constitution's based on the principle of deliberate debate. So, I, I, I probably have convinced you I can become evangelical about this. I apologize. <laughs> I guess my question's uh, relatively easy, but um, while I agree with the problem with misinformation and misnomers, um, how does your organization or yourself deal with the problem of just general apathy? I mean, I can speak for my generation, and I know for probably the generation following, that they, we just don't care as much anymore you know, about these global problems, and we're not as willing to get involved and do things about it. So yes. what is the, how do you address that problem? We, we actually have not encountered that. We have never been turned down by a scientist interview. We've never been turned down on an invitation to participate. Governments pay for this. It's a sincere form of participation. Um, your generation actually has been incredibly enthusiastic. And, um, and I hope the, the ones of you know who are not will, will th think about it another time. The, um, th this sounds like a parent talking to <laughs> a child. But y you guys are going to do this, not me. Um, not going to be around for the conclusion of this story. What I think is very important is you get a sense of what your opinion is. You know, if you, do, if you have a strong opinion based on misinformation, that's a big problem. And one of the things that I often got in trouble for, I mentioned it a couple times today, so this is being recorded and I'll probably get in trouble again for it, is the government it follows the acronym D, DUI too often. DUI, we know, stands in general for d driving under the influence. I re renamed it. It's decisions unencumbered by information. Not opinions, information. So if you make decisions based on your generation or anybody else's in a, in a community in which the information is all wrong, well, at least you made a decision. All right? uh, hopefully you get the right information, and I'm suggesting universities are the place to find the information. So I wouldn't look at the internet. Okay, in my opinion. So I, I, hope you'll, I hope you'll encourage your generation to do it. We have had a large number of very talented students who participate with us already. We have uh, 26 universities around the world who are eager to participate in that program on graduate students. And there's an undergraduate role that I could describe another time. Bert. Then John. I, I'm going to follow on Ahmed's question. Um, I, I think that the U.S. House and Senate has five maybe 10 years to act on global climate change. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then we're going to face a very uncertain future and one in which life as we know it on this planet could change. Because the, the world system is so massive that if you want to change what's going to happen in 2050, you've got to do something now to affect that change. And we're, we're a society of immediacy. I want to be able to text. I want to be able to email. I want to be able to call right now. And the U.S. House has elections in two months, and they want, all they're concerned about is, will I get reelected? They are concerned about 2050. And the Senate, which is supposed to have a longer term view, okay, so theirs is five years instead of, you know, 40 years. And so I'm really very pessimistic about the U.S. House and Senate doing anything that's going to make an impact on global climate in 2050. So how can, how can IGSC, your, your international? ISGP, yeah. Yeah, ISGP. Science Policy Institute. How can how can that engage folks from the House and the Senate? I mean, looking at the you know the academies and different departments of energy or so forth, that's that's useful. But you've got to you've got to change the opinion of people in the House and the Senate. Yeah. Well, um, there are limits to my wisdom, and you've certainly chosen an area. I I can't convince you that you'll have that type of impact in, in a short period of time. Uh, but wait a minute, maybe you will. I sure as hell know, bluntly, you're not going to have anything if you don't engage in the conversation. So we're going to assemble about 65 policy people in October in just outside Washington. Okay? There's 65 people who are willing to pay their way to Washington from Italy and Japan and even from D.C. Uh, to come and spend the time with us. So that's a start. And I think that is the point. You must get started. 
the NSFs of the world, the NIHs and so forth, the Department of Defense supporting it, the Homeland Security, these have been heroes to support the program. So they're taking a chance. Uh, I've mentioned NSF, but there, there's no NSF money in it. So yes, there is a risk, there's a gamble, there's no guarantees in this process. Now about this House and Senate business, okay? The House and Senate issue, I would agree, is a, a major challenge for how this society is structured. One could ask the question, is, is this the right structure that's going to be able to do anything? Different story, different conversation. But I think that there is an opportunity to take advantage of those who are in the House and Senate who have a serious um, degree of responsibility for their, their task. There are people there who are very serious about their responsibility. Now, they are the people you clearly want to target. There are a lot of other, there are other people who don't fit that description, but you've got to start. And, you know, or, or I can retire <laughs> and perhaps join Dexter and go to the Caribbean on, on, on a vacation or something. I mean, those, those are choices too. I, I don't believe that you should be quite that pessimistic. I think there are good stewards of responsibility in the legislature and they have a interest in doing this. We have members of the Congress at the, attending these meetings members of the British Parliament. Uh, one member from the Diet in uh, Japan may or may not be able to make it. But sooner or later, if the reputation of the Institute's work continues to grow, it will be a place where you're irritated with me for not getting invited. Right now, it's a little irritation. I want it to be a lot of irritation. Okay? So, understand, there are limitations. No guarantees. But, but I would say it's still worth the gamble. Somebody had a question here, John. I think too much of the debate and the discussion and the dialogue with the various parties is focused too much on the problem as opposed to the solution. I think we need to integrate more into these various dialogues and solutions. And I'm finding that, and this is just subjective looking, but in terms of, of we as a scientific community, we are moving more over on the solution side. Uh, as we were 10 years ago when we were, when we were indicating the problems. Yes. But, I, but I think we need to ramp it up even more. I, and that's what we feel more comfortable about. That's a more positive uh, uh, approach. And, and, it, and it also uh, opens the dialogue where you automatically close the dialogue when, when, when you're problem versus problem, or whether you have a problem. All right. I, I couldn't agree more with you. You can't come to the Institute meeting unless you have a solution. So, no scientist is invited unless their paper which usually goes through three or four levels of review, it is very difficult to get scientists to write three pages that make any sense in terms of, of solutions. We just, just finished this last week. Couldn't agree more. You don't get to come unless you have a solution, and the debate is about the solution. You have to say to me, John, I think you should do this. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you gotta stand up for 40 to 90 minutes and defend it. I, uh, we once had a meeting that's actually perhaps important to this community why was graduate education, undergraduate and graduate education in science and technology a national security problem? I convened this in Washington several years ago with the Department of Defense. And so we had uh, Joe Stiglitz came and a lot of famous people. And I opened the meeting by saying, we're gonna be talking for the today, there are two meetings. The first one is about the problem. I think this is a problem of the national, the intellectual security of this country. Let's call it the intellectual security. Okay? We have boundary securities and so on. This is the intellectual security. But the second meeting you can't come to unless you bring me a solution. No one gets invited to speak unless you send me a solution. We held that out in Virginia, enormously successful meeting. But it was only solutions. So you get, you get one meeting to talk about the problem. Everybody was nodding their head. Yeah, it's a big problem. And there's a new uh, popular science magazine called Solutions that has, uh, was launched earlier this year that yes. I think we'll be seeing a lot more of. I like that, yeah. So now we just have to be sure the guys listen and understand. A few years, just quickly, one other quick point. Um, I have never seen an analysis of our energy needs that doesn't include a massive amount of nuclear plant power plants. It doesn't matter if it's from the CIA or the British, it doesn't matter. The British, if the, when North Sea oil gives out, the British will depend on Russian gas for 70 some odd percent of their energy. From that point on, the discussion was only about how to build more nuclear plants in Britain. I was, a few years ago, I uh, went to Ukraine, and I went to Chernobyl. And I spent a long visit to Chernobyl. 
Anybody who doesn't believe in the problems of nuclear energy problems, go to Chernobyl. You can't get there very easily. It's a 100 kilometer path. You can't live there at all. It's really quite remarkable. But you got a choice. If you go to your home and turn on the switch for the light bulb and you get a busy signal, you know? I grew up when you picked up the telephone and somebody was on the line. Oh, I'll, I'll call back in a few minutes, right? There was only so much capacity. Think of that for electricity. Turn on your computer, oh, sorry, no electricity for the moment, wait for half an hour. <laughs> if you want that, that's one choice. And probably, unfortunately, from where we are, you're gonna build a lot of nuclear plants to get to the point where you can have solar energy or wind or other things take over. And you gotta invest in those, no problem with that. So, where are we making it? Have you seen many nuclear plants built recently? The licensing process is nine years. They're trying to reduce it to a couple of years, but you know, th this problem isn't going away. So, so there's a solution. You should be debating that solution, in my opinion. We don't. When you guys are incredibly patient. I, I don't know I deserve any of this attention whatsoever. A couple more questions here. David, then Ken. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that uh, uh, you were talking about the nuclear power thing. I remember uh, recently debating a friend of mine about that that retired from the government and he was really touting it. And I said, well, you still have the waste disposal problem and look, you know, witness Yucca Mountain. And, uh, but you were talking about the indecisiveness about the, I think people need to be more forthcoming and explain things and what we get is, you know, in, like in the global warming thing in the politics, and I said, well, the evidence is there if you're willing to really look at it and consider it. And, uh, but okay. um, that's the problem today. But people need to be, you know, more decisive and forthright. And uh, what was the other, the, there was something else you were talking about. The, uh, um, well, anyway, that's what I wanted to say pretty much, you know, just in response to your, There's your comments. There's a presidential commission looking at Yucca Mountain as we speak. They're meeting actually next week. You know, a number of them it may not be geologically stable and see what the, the problem is they've gotten to me is they've gotten away from the science and they've gotten in these other things and they... Uh, 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 you didn't get the lesson. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a political process. Oh, I realize that. I know. I'm just saying that... Well, I, I, I have a solution. Right. Uh, uh, well, that's what I was going to say next was that uh, I usually, like, for example, when I do work for people, I try to come up with solutions. Well, it, it, I admire that. Uh, there are a lot of mountains around Asheville. Right. Yucca Mountain's one mountain out in Nevada. I mean, would you like to offer a couple mountains here to store this stuff? Yeah, okay. But, but um, <laughs> being a real, really irritant to you, I'm sure. The point is you got to make a decision. Because one day you will turn on the light bulb, the switch, and you won't get a light. I think there's too much today, and there's time for action. So that's well, there's time for action, and, and a reasonable, thoughtful way of managing the risk. Right. Exactly. So I, I understand the point. Right. I agree. Um, this is a more procedural question. Um, how do the debates go that you have are with the critical debates where you have the 65 policy members? Mm -hmm. Because it just seems to me that you're not actually addressing the issue of communication if, in, if you are boiling them down to three pages because then you just have three very condensed pages of a lot of words that no one may or may not understand. Oh, no, no, no. So come and work with this and I'll show you how this works, but let me describe it very briefly. We go to the scientists, we say, please send us three pages. We get something that's not acceptable, okay? I mean, literally is not, the jargon in it and so forth. We, we go through, we, we recently have gone through four reviews of that paper trying to say, you know, what does this acronym mean? What does this term mean? What, what does the word this mean? We try very hard to work with them in a very constructive way, in a ways that they'll accept, it's their paper, but to try to focus it on specificity. So we work hard at that. That's part of our responsibility as an institute. So that when the person reads the paper, they have some degree of an answer to your question. Now, we may not be totally successful, but now I want to put you in the middle. This is a circle of uh, policy guys, 65 outside, I put the scientist in the middle, all eight of them, one time. I say to Professor Squibb, it's your turn. We were going to discuss your paper. We have five minutes set aside for you to summarize. I have an extremely expensive egg timer. Five minutes, it goes off. Uh, Mid-sentence, we stop, and we turn it over to the audience. 
So the person has provided a specific set of recommendations. In, you know, surveillance on infectious diseases will not work. Right? If the guy from China got off the plane in New York rather than Toronto with SARS, we'd be talking with fewer people in the audience. And most epidemiologists say that. Okay? So I want to reassure you, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really quite exciting. <laughs> people don't talk to each other after a day or so. Yes, sir. Uh, my question refers back to uh, public opinion and whatnot. Yes. As uh, was mentioned earlier, the immediacy of something, if you say, turn on the TV and there's something about climate change and you see drastic pictures and some numbers, that's all well and good. You turn it off, you go outside, it's a beautiful sunny day outside, that sort of loses its opinion yes. or that impact. Uh, how do we as a scientist impress upon the public community that there is something needs to be done for either this or, as you say, infectious diseases, like you just said, the uh, yes. SARS uh, example. If it happens up in Canada, it's not happening next door to our neighbors. We're not really, it's not in the forefront of our minds. It's in the back. How do we really address this issue at the public level? You don't have any Canadian friends? One. One, okay. <laughs> Well, it's a fine question, and, I, and again, um, I want to be concise. In each of the questions, you could ask this about dozens and dozens of scientific issues. You walk outside and there's a lot of snow on the ground last year, and you wonder if people use global warming. I think global climate change is perhaps a little more accurate uh, ver version of this. Clearly, a, a scientist, a climatologist particularly, much better than I can, can explain why the local events will be changing. If you're in the mountains, it's going to be different than the Sonoran Desert where I live and so forth. So there, there are logical discussions that people want to listen to why it's going to move up and down and so forth. It isn't as if uh, you know, the tundra in northern Canada is suddenly going to become covered with uh, fields of grain, right? But there are serious issues. And I think many people, many scientists are extremely well prepared to talk about, for example, the question on the oceans, the salinity of the oceans, the acidity of the oceans, the effect on, on the sea, seafood and so forth. You have to go through that process, but it takes time and it takes, confident, it takes confidence and it takes articulation. If you send somebody in that can't articulate it, it's a disaster. So you have to choose carefully. But professors are very good at this. Students are very good at it. Great skills. You got to start the process. All right? And I think the question of, for example, infectious diseases, um, it, it is a remarkably easy argument to make. You only have to look back to 1918, 1919. Right? Somewhere between, I don't know, 20 million and 100 million people died. Um, the, that's a fairly big impression. In Philadelphia, they had no body bags enough. They would stack bodies on the street. Okay, read, read, read about it. The great influenza, well-known well, documentation. The actor Kevin McCarthy just died. His parents both died. Right. And so these are stories that clearly identify the scale of the problem. Dengue fever has now appeared in the United States. I'm going to scare the hell out of you. Dengue <laughs> fever has appeared in the United States. Right? It's a, it's a serious disease. Right? So you, well, we can say oh, not a problem. I'll give you one last one that I promise to finish. If you go to a public, if you go to a, a cocktail conversation, a pleasant dinner conversation among your colleagues, I went to one in North Carolina about two months ago. Very nice opportunity to speak at a university. I won't tell you where. It was a wonderful evening. You know, 30 faculty members there. And uh, we were talking about the subject of vaccination. Okay, Novartis, Novartis just held a meeting in Siena I attended just before this dinner in which we discussed the problem of how to get confidence in the public of taking vaccines. 90 million doses of H1N1 vaccine were never taken in the United States. You could go down to your local drugstore. It was free, basically. Why did 90 some odd million people not take it? Well, they just thought it was gonna be a problem. And no, I can guarantee you almost without exception in that crowd of 30 people, someone will say, worried about vaccines because autism <laughs> is a possible consequence. Now, I am profoundly concerned about autism, autism right, profoundly. But the guy who did this study that was publicized so widely, it was found to falsify the data. He's been disbarred. Yeah. 30, 30 some odd studies never repeated the result. Okay. It's rational to say this is probably not the problem we think it is. It's something else, but it's a tragedy and it should be addressed, no doubt about it. 
But the fact of the matter is, if you don't vaccinate the pop population against some of these childhood diseases, you're going to, there'll be, there'll be consequences for that. And so why do people not take them? Well, because there's an example of a very popularized piece of information that looks at least like it's incorrect. All right, so there's a debate that you can have with people. Uh, some will not believe you, right? But, but you gotta have the debate, so. George, thank you very much. Uh, thank it. you. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions uh, can be um, held down here as you're exiting. Thank you all for coming. Dexter, Joanne, appreciate you being here. Levon, Kevin, it's a pleasure seeing you guys again. Um, so enjoy your rest of your evening. <laughs>